Okay, uh, I want to keep context going, uh, especially with regard to the letters of Paul. Uh, we talked at the very beginning of reading Genesis in its own rights. And, and there was a feeling that I think all of us shared that, wouldn't it, that, that it would be nice to be able to look at sort of all of the scripture at once. So, so that we're not just looking at an isolated text. And I promised you we would eventually develop to that point. Well, we are, we are about halfway there. We're coming to the point of seeing the larger scriptural text in context. Uh, and so that'll be our goal today. So let me just bring it back, bring us back to where we started with Paul in his letter to Galatians. Uh, some sides on this debate want to isolate certain passages and emphasize other passages. Our goal is to be fair and balanced and look carefully at every passage that might be relevant. Every passage I as an egalitarian might think relevant or my colleague as a complementarian might think is relevant. We should look at all of them and consider them with the same kind of seriousness, weight, uh, the same kind of submission to the text uh, and the same kind of open heart and open mind. So the, the truth of the gospel, we, we had talked about uh, ontology, if you want to think in theological terms, or, or our being in Christ, our status in Christ, and underscored function in Christ, as Paul called the Jews to live out consistently uh, the issues regarding circumcision, fellowship with Gentiles, and holy days in particular, but then several statements that are more general about living out our faith. And then last time, looking at 1 Corinthians 7, uh, we talked about Greco-Roman household codes, because in this context, Paul now is not just mentioning that the Jew-Gentile paradigm is also applicable to men and women, male and female, but now he is focusing on the issue of marriage in particular and singleness as his preferred option. So, Understanding the cultural context informs the text that we're looking at. We're going to look at some videos in the second half of the uh, hour today uh, in which a couple of my colleagues, Eric Tonis and Dave Talley, will be sharing their views on Genesis and Ephesians in particular as we bring these two passages together. Uh, and the issue of cultural background with regard to context will be a very important issue that they'll discuss. The authority of the biblical text should never underscore, never be ignored because of its cultural backdrop. On the other hand, the cultural backdrop sheds light on the issues that the present writer is, is writing about or the issues he's writing to with regard to the church. Uh, and always, I, I would agree with uh, Dr. Tonis on this, always we should bring enduring principles forward. Uh, I, I apply this even with Mosaic Law, which I would say probably most, if not all of us, would, would dismiss with a wave of a hand and say, we're not under the law, don't go there. But, but I think there are principles in the Mosaic Law that we can apply in our lives, uh, although we have to factor them out from their historical and cultural context because we're not living as Jews under the Mosaic system. So, just for the sake of backdrop and understanding, the hierarchy of the husband or the master or the head, we'll talk about that today, of the household over his wife, children, and slaves, the relative difference in age, 10, 15, 20 years, um, 25 to 30 for the husband in the early teens for the wife. So this component that we don't have today about the husband completing the raising of his wife, uh, the wife's responsibility within the home to manage children and slaves, and the cultural reality uh, that this is obviously not something Paul is endorsing. In fact, he's speaking strictly against it in 1 Corinthians 7, but the idea of the husband seeking his sexual pleasure outside of the home, uh, whereas his wife has a more functional purpose with regard to managing the home. And then the idea of honoring this cultural norm uh, as part of being a good citizen. This will especially become important when we come to the uh, letter of Peter, the first letter of Peter. Uh, and so we looked last time at 12 different issues, but related uh, 
but nevertheless different issues at a lengthy passage, 2 through 35, with regard to marriage, being faithful, giving the privilege to the other person, uh, a, a willing, mutual yielding of authority so that neither person possesses it or uh, exercises it, let alone wields it, but rather we yield it to our spouse if we enter into a marriage relationship. Even in the areas of spiritual things like devoting ourselves to prayer, finding consent, freedom in the death of a spouse. It's the same for the husband and the wife, not just a unilateral principle. Uh, with regard to initiating divorce with a believer or with an unbeliever, it's the same principle for the husband and wife. Providing sacred space, the issues of sanctification and salvation came to play in our discussion last week. Responsibility, which some would argue is more the husband's than the wife, is bilaterally shared. It's mutually shared in this context. And God's desire that we have peace. If uh, the other person does something we'd rather they didn't do, if they, they choose to leave, it's not our responsibility for the other person, it's our responsibility to the other person. And that is shared in a mutual way. Uh, and then not seeking uh, a, a change of status. Uh, if you're married, that's fine. If you're not married, don't get in a hurry to get married. Don't come to college for the sake of finding a spouse. That's not necessarily what we're here for. Uh, and overall, above all, devote yourselves to ministry. Uh, make sure that whatever you do by way of choices for your own lifestyle, that it is the best thing for serving Christ and honoring Christ in your life. And that is the chief priority that we have, to, to love God and to serve Him forever. Um, so we come then today, if my PowerPoint will, to Ephesians 5. Uh, I thought I would share with you a, a moment of the past here. In 1969, May 24th, so it'll be 44 this year, um, a wedding picture for, for Pat and myself. Doesn't she look nice? Okay, I just have to kind of enjoy that for a moment. Uh, uh, but loving and serving each other, I borrowed the phrase from Howard Marshall in his article in uh, DBE. Uh, but I think it captures what's going on in the loving and serving language of uh, Ephesians 5. Uh, to put it in the context, it's written in the same year Paul writes Philemon. Uh, and so as he's thinking about slaves, that third component in Galatians that he spoke of briefly, cryptically, as he's thinking of that, not trying to override the social agenda and this is very important, the social agenda of slavery, uh, although I don't think Paul was, was endorsing it by not overriding it, but nevertheless, the issue wasn't change the structure. The issue was how do you live within the structure as Christians? And so his dear brother Philemon and his dear son in the faith Onesimus and how should they relate to each other as brothers in Christ? So, so, he, so he sends Onesimus back, and you might say, well, tell him to go back and obey his master, is endorsing the authority of the slave master. And, and no, he, he's sending him back so that the one in power can be called and given the opportunity to relinquish that power and to treat him no longer as a slave, Paul's language, but to treat him instead as a dear brother, even as he would treat the apostle himself. So, so these are important contexts for coming into Ephesians. We don't just jump from Genesis to Ephesians and kind of ignore everything that's happened in between. Because as Paul's writing Philemon in the same year, he's also writing the twin letters of Ephesians and Colossians. Colossians much shorter, Ephesians longer. Ephesians is the one that is almost always turned to when it comes to questions of marriage. Uh, it is by far the most popular passage for uh, that little pastor's anecdote or charge or sermonette that he or she would do in, in performing a wedding ceremony. Uh, Ephesians 5, almost uh, certainly the first place to stop. 
Uh, but Colossians should be brought in alongside of it, uh, always to be complete in our looking at the different passages. And then finally, geography, just to remind ourselves, they're not just twin letters in the way they are shaped structurally, theologically, but they are also addressed to twin cities, cities that are right uh, beside each other. So Ephesians, Ephesus, and Colossae for the letter to the Colossians. Again, in the general area of the Galatians uh, circulating letter and just across the, the float there to the city of Corinth, which we had looked at briefly with regard to 1 Corinthians 7. So I want to start us today uh, by raising a question that I think this passage addresses. Uh, and of course, with the other passages we just talked about. Uh, and, and it's a negative question. I, I don't plan to leave us with the negative. I'll provide the positive. Uh, but what the Bible does not say so far, and we'll ask, does it say it here? Uh, because this, in Paul's writing, this will be the last marriage comments that he will make. So I, I've labeled it as seven common assumptions regarding husbands that, that are often made. Uh, first of all, that the husband has some kind of a, how, how does our author for this week put it, George Knight, has a divine mandate to be the head of the house. That this is an imperative, a, think about our interpretive language, this is a prescription, a command by Paul, that the husband should be the head of the house. That he should, assumptions of, of prescription, he should exercise authority over his wife. And I'm not using it in the negative term here of wielding authority in an abusive and or inappropriate way, but there is some kind of exercising authority that usually comes in the terms of making a final decision. So the husband should give a servant kind of leadership to the family, and this in particular here to his wife, to the children is a little more obvious uh, because they're younger, not old enough to lead on their own yet, but to the wife, who otherwise would be viewed as his peer, uh, to give servant leadership to the wife. Uh, and so even though uh, the, the use of the word head is often translated or, or interpreted to mean authority, uh, complementarians will almost immediately go to the term leadership and, and modify that with servant leadership. So, so this is in particular, these assumptions are more complementarian assumptions that are regularly made in distinction from older patriarchy, where the idea of servant leadership wasn't, wasn't that important in the modern complementarian movement that has become a very important emphasis. That the husband should somehow be the initiator in the marriage to which his wife then will respond. So he's the initiator, she's the responder. You've read Dave Talley's article for today. We're gonna to talk about that and listen to some comments in his video uh, that will address that very specifically. That uh, as one who exercises authority and is the head of the house, that the husband will make final decisions for the family. Now, now of course, he will talk this out with his wife. He will make sure she feels like she is being heard. He will make whatever decision he makes for the sake of his wife, for her good, for her benefit, as he understands it. Uh, and he, before the Lord, then will have that lonely responsibility to make the decision, the final decision, when they disagree. If they can come to an agreement on something, this is a moot issue. But if they don't, then this is the issue that's raised. That the husband should, should somehow set the spiritual direction for the family. These, these are uh, terms that Clint Arnold uses, our, our Dean at Talbot, when he talks about his responsibility as the head of his house, as a complementarian. Set the spiritual direction of the family. Uh, and it's not based on whether the husband is necessarily more spiritual. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Dr. Tonis will say in the video this afternoon, he thinks men are less spiritual than women, uh, generally speaking, right? Actually, as he puts it, more sinful than women. So, so women, you can feel a little bit better about that, and men, not so much better. Uh, but nevertheless, the husband should set the spiritual direction. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the husband should be responsible for his wife, operative 
infinitive there responsible for? Let, let's hold the question until a little bit later. Okay, thanks. So, seven assumptions that I think are regularly made, at least I hear them all the time, uh, in complementary contexts. I have been in a place, uh, my first 10 years of teaching here, where I made many of these assumptions. So I speak not only from secondhand, but also firsthand experience. That these are things we often assume going into a marriage, Pat and I did in 1969, uh, and things we assume coming to the biblical text. Uh, I'm not suggesting we should try to discredit any of these. I'm just saying let's look at the biblical text and see if the biblical text actually makes these statements that I actually will then validate our assumptions if we're coming with the assumptions. So, okay, turn with me to Ephesians. And as we did with Corinthians and Galatians, the larger context, so we want to do with Ephesians to make sure we're reading the text in its literary context. We'll also talk about its cultural backdrop as a context, but the literary context, the one everybody agrees on. Uh, and let's start right with the first verse. Uh, 30 times in the letter, and I'm not going to read all 30 of them for the sake of time, but I want us to at least look at the first chapter. I might pick a couple verses here and there so that you get the idea of how frequently this phrase, one in Christ, or in Christ, or in Him, or in Christ Jesus, how frequently these parallel phrases occur. Now keep in mind, this was Paul's punchline in Galatians. As he's building this case for, for Gentiles not needing to become Jews, for that old distinction of Jew Gentile no longer being relevant, either in status or function, he comes to that climactic moment when he just says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. Not even male and female, for we are all one in Christ. It's that phrase that he picks up in, in Ephesians. Begin right at the uh, first verse here. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. So, so this idea of, of being in the body of Christ, very important. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. And I, th I think the, the verse ends there rather um, the sentence ends there rather than the way the ESV takes the last phrase and puts it on the next uh, sentence. Skip to verse 7 just for the sake of time. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven, things on the earth, in Him we have obtained an inheritance. We have been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory, in Him, you also, when you heard the word of, the tr of truth, go back to Galatians, this truth of the gospel, concern, the gospel of your salvation, same concept brought forward, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Remember in Galatians 3, if you are in Christ, then you are heirs together with the right, same rights and heir, heir uh, inheritance as firstborn sons. So, guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Okay, skip forward a little bit to verse 19. I'll come a little bit past the phrase on the screen or the reference on the screen. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power? Now, sometimes you have to start in the middle of a sentence with Paul because his sentence goes on for 15 verses. Okay, so what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe 
according to the working of his great work, his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now look at the image of Jesus as being portrayed. It helps us to understand what it means to be in Christ. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, that above, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him, gave Christ, as head over all things to the church. Or literally, it's a dative of benefit for the benefit of the church, for the sake of the church. So he's head over all rule, authority, power, and dominion for the sake of the church, which is his body, and notice his function now with regard to the church, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we'll come back and talk a little more about headship, but I wanted to hear that verse as what it means to be in Christ, that he is the head over all the powers in the world for our sake, for the sake of the church, whom he fills. He is a source of fullness for us. Skip down in chapter 2 to verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Not a result of work so that one may boast, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, the idea of reconciliation and being a new creation. Going back to Galatians, the new community. Uh, it doesn't matter anymore, circumcision, uncircumcision. What matters is a new creation, Paul says. So we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Same kind of language he used again in Galatians where he said, as you have come to faith in Christ, so you should walk in Christ. Uh, and then he picks up that Galatians motif, that Galatians paradigm regarding Jews and Gentiles in verse 11. Let me just uh, bring the click down here as we come into chapter 2. Uh, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles, and now he is specifically addressing them. It's not that he doesn't have principles that apply to Jews also, but in this case, he wants to point them out and get their attention. You Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. Again, the, these are old terms, old markers, separators. The circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were not in Christ. You were outside of the, the community of God. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope. You were without God in the world. I feel the desperation of these poor people and where they were. But verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, in the body of Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. So Jew and Gentile, two separate distinctions, two are now one, one new creation, one new body. Uh, he's building off of the very same theme that he developed at length in Galatians. So both one has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances. Radical language for a Jewish rabbi like Paul. Abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinance that he might create, there's that new creation, create in himself one new humanity. I, I would digress from the N or the ESV translation of one new man. It's not a gender issue in this case. It's bringing together Jews and Gentiles. One new humanity in place of the two, Jew versus Gentile uh, division of humanity. So making peace 
and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So, so once again, the, the Galatians reference, also the 2 Corinthians 5 reference. Skip down to verse 19. So then you who, so, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens, which they couldn't have been under Old Testament law. Now they are in this new sort of spiritual body, spiritual nation, fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Uh, verse 21, again a long sentence. In whom, in Christ, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So, so, so feel this, this uh, provision of Christ in making our new creation, and then we grow up in Him. We grow into our fullness, into this now spiritual temple, not a literal one anymore, but a spiritual temple. In him, then, verse 22, end of the chapter, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place, a single one, for God, by the Spirit. So there's this powerful sense of oneness that is the introductory, foundational uh, thesis of Paul's as he comes to talk about various issues that relate to what we'll see rather clearly as the, as the household codes. He will address the very issues the codes uh, address. Okay, chapter 3 then, uh, the mystery of Christ, verses 1 through 6, and I'm just going to pick up in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. He's repeating much of what he said in Galatians. And so Galatians is not unrelated to Ephesians, it's tightly connected instead. They are fellow heirs, member of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And of course, it's not just about them being saved, it's about now how they live it out with regard to circumcision, with regard to fellowship, uh, and though he doesn't mention it here, also with regard to the holy days, the observances of the law. So Christ is the head, and this is before we get to any reference of head language for, for husbands. Okay, Christ is the head for his body, the church. This one new humanity that God has created of believers. He is the head over the authorities of this world for the benefit of the church. Uh, the, just, just to be clear, my comment about dative of benefit uh, in the way the Greek expresses this. Uh, I talked to a very dear friend, longtime colleague now, Victor Ree. Uh, he loves to pull his first and last name together into victory, victory in Jesus. Uh, but Victor is uh, a, a longtime professor of uh, Greek at uh, Talbot. And Victor is complementarian, uh, but he's also the kind of person that uh, enjoys a discussion Matter of fact, he enjoys a discussion about Greek grammar much more than I do. Uh, but a discussion on Greek grammar, he gets all excited about it. Uh, and, and he is able to look at the text, the grammar of the text, w without going to what implications it might have for the gender debate. So I called him on the phone and I asked him about this text. And I said, this looks to me like a date of a benefit, uh, that, that it is Christ as head for the sake of, for the, the, as a source of provision for the church. And, and over the phone, you have to understand Victor here, over the phone he gets out like five commentaries, three Greek grammars, he's got his text in front of him. He's just, he's so happy I called. Uh, what else was he doing that day on a Saturday afternoon except studying Greek? Uh, and so he said, it's absolutely what is happening here. Uh, it, it's not just for the church, it's for the benefit of the church. Uh, so I think that's important to understand because uh, we will see head used in chapter 5 with regard to the husband over the wife, which is some kind of metaphor for the church, its relationship to Christ. And so it's important to understand what Paul has said so far with regard to headship, or matter of fact, leave the ship off of it, just head. It's, it's a metaphor metaphor. 
There's no abstract principle that's developed. It's a metaphor that's being used uh, in three occasions in Ephesians. So, okay, um, chapter 4. Let's come to chapter 4. There's a second reference to head that I want us to see here. Uh, but let's pick up the context in the opening uh, verses. The, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, mind you of his writing to Philemon where they were in prison together, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have, uh, by which you have been called, or to which you have been called. So again, it's, it's ontology, it's being or status, and leading then to function. Ontology or being that leads to function. You are one in Christ, therefore live like one in Christ. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. With all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another. We're going to talk in the second half of the hour today about Paul's one another statements. Uh, there's 18 different things that he suggests ought to be a one another relationship, and this is one of them, bearing with one another, sort of holding up under the difficulties of life. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And now skip down to verse 15, uh, rather than being tossed about by every wind of doctrine, rather than being under the influence of other things, he says, rather speaking the truth in love, here's his concern about the truth of the gospel, we are to, and here's that, that same imagery, grow up in every way into Him, into Christ. So the in Christ uh, image brings us right up to the passage that is uh, under discussion. We we'll grow up every way into him who is the head, that is, into Christ. Now, what does head mean in this context? How is Jesus the head for the church that is supposed to grow up into him? Verse 16, from whom, from Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every joint, head, body metaphor in both of these passages, by every joint is equipped, uh, with which is, the, is equipped, sorry, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So, so where do we get this power, this ability, this uh, mandate, this encouragement to grow in Christ not just individually, as we might think in our sort of Western culture here, but to grow up as a community, a, a, a new humanity in Christ. It, it comes from the head-body metaphor here. It's expressed in a head-body metaphor where the head is the source of that growth, and, and we grow into the head. So, so two things that are expressed here. Is there authority, is there a concept of authority connected with head? And, and the answer is, oh, well, of course, right there in 18 through 23 of chapter 1. But it is authority over the worldly powers for the sake of the church for which Jesus is a source of provision. And then again in 4, 15 and 16, he is the source of provision for the church so that we can grow into him. So, so I think both, both ideas have to be kept together when it comes to referencing the church, and we haven't come to the marriage passage yet, but he will use this idea in the marriage passage, so we don't want to take it out of this context. When it comes to referencing the church, the emphasis Paul makes in both passages is that Christ is the source of provision for the church. Now, I'm not, I'm not challenging the rather obvious fact that Christ is also an authority over the church. He's an authority over everything. He's God. Uh, that's not a question at all in the context. The question is, how is Paul using a metaphor, head and body together, the head-body metaphor? Uh, and again, I'll reference Clint Arnold's work. Uh, I think I've mentioned it before once, but uh, it's important in this context. This is where he did the study, uh, both in women and men in ministry as also in a, uh, a feshrift, a, a celebratory writing in honor of someone's 70th birthday, a feshrift that was done for his mentor, uh, I. Howard Marshall. 
Uh, hopefully you recognize the name I. Howard Marshall. I'm looking. <laughs> From your reading for today, you read I. Howard Marshall. And so in a festria for his mentor at Aberdeen, uh, Clint did a study on the idea of head and body as it relates to the Ephesians Colossians material. And in that he pointed out, uh, based on the medical terminology, uh, the, again he's going to cultural background, historical cultural background, even though he's a complementarian, we all do this because it's a good hermeneutic. Uh, so he goes to that background and he says if you look at the medical writings of that day, the head was understood as the source of life for the body. Uh, whereas we think the heart perhaps is the source of life for the body. But, but the imagery there of the head providing life, a, a source of provision as, as Arnold describes it, source of provision is endorsed by Paul in both of his references to head of Christ over the church. So keep that in mind as we come into the text in chapter 5. Okay, let's skip then to chapter 5. <clears throat> Keeping the uh, one in Christ context in mind, the very powerful, almost overstated by Paul, one in Christ context, let's come to the specific chapter and the spe specific, the immediate context for our passage. <clears throat> Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So because you're children, you live in a certain way, status and function and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now skip down, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Keep in mind the Old Testament idea of wisdom here. <clears throat> the, the fool, the person who's unwise, says in his heart there's no God. That, that, that reflects the, the wisdom of Proverbs and Psalm, even that found sort of in reflection of Ecclesiastes and Job. Uh, being wise means you know how to fear the Lord and walk in His way. <clears throat> so it's not about IQ, it's not about uh, the way you perform on the SATs, it's about godly living, knowing how to live life before God. So walk as wise, not as unwise making the best of your time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish. Again, moral connotation. <coughs> but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But, but instead, instead of being intoxicated with wine, be intoxicated with the Spirit. Let the Spirit fill uh, you, be, be under the influence of the spirit instead of the wine. Addressing one another, now he, he's going to flesh out what it means to walk in the spirit, to be filled with the spirit, and he'll do it with a series of participles. So, be filled with the spirit, first of all, speaking or singing, <coughs> ESV, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and thirdly, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So what does it look like? This isn't everything about spirit-filled life, obviously. But these are three things he's addressing specifically to this church in Ephesus about what it would mean <clears throat> to be under the influence of the Spirit. Let the Spirit control your life. So, uh, giving praise to God, singing to one another, is celebrating the, the uh, in Christ experience together. <coughs> giving thanks to God and mutual submission. Here's another one of his one another statements. Submitting to one another. Now I want to pause for just a second here and ask an important question. I'll reference my, my longtime mentor and friend, colleague Bob Sosie, uh, 
uh, distinguished systematic theology professor at Talbot and the one who I think holds the longest record uh, for full-time teaching in Biola's history. Uh, he's approaching his 50-year mark of full-time teaching uh, and I'm not sure exactly on the numbers. I should probably check because he might make it. <clears throat> Sosi will argue in his book, Women and Men in Ministry, and in many of the lectures and, and debates he's taken part of, taken part in, he will argue that submission, the, the Greek term hupotasso, which we'll talk more about, submission literally means hupo. Tasso, two words brought together into one, uh, ordering yourself under another. And with that definition, he, he will insist that the call to submission is one that implies, here's that critical term again, implies the authority of the other person. A call for one of you to submit to another implies that the other has authority over you because you are ordering yourself under, wooden literal translation of upo tasso, you're ordering yourself under that other person. <clears throat> now, I, I have no doubt that when a person is submitting to another person who by other standards, is obviously in authority over them, uh, in a military rank, let's say, uh, where the sergeant is submitting to the general, <clears throat> that there is authority in those contexts. But is that authority made clear by the term submission? Now, I'm asking the term, I'm asking that question generally, first of all, and then I want us to focus it in specifically on this new relationship, this one new humanity that God has created in Christ. And to think in the context of 18 different one another statements, but specifically this one another statement, is submitting to one another, and it's, it's in the middle voice, yield yourself, middle voice in Greek, yield yourself to one another, does, does that imply the authority of the other person? It, it seems to me that it, in this radically new creation that God has made that we call the church, in this radically new creation, the idea of mutual submission uh, no more implies the authority, especially a, a unilateral authority of another person over you, than the idea of yielding authority in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 4, both the husband and the wife yielding authority would imply that they each have authority over the other person. Uh, the point is not that you should exercise your authority. The point is you should yield your authority. So it seems that by, by starting this out with a one another statement, the idea of mutual submission is the groundwork. It is the foundation for what Paul is about to say. Now secondly, and I'll just bring it up on the screen here and then we'll look in more detail uh, at the text. But secondly, <clears throat> there is no verb in the next sentence. It's either an implied verb or, or, or maybe you should use a different kind of punctuation instead of a period. Keep in mind the Greek text doesn't have punctuation. That's interpretive. But <clears throat> the full sentence reads like this, and, and it was a long sentence, so once again we're picking up in the middle. But giving thanks, verse 20, submitting to one another out of reference for Christ maybe with an M dash to follow, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, how many of you in your English translations of this, I'm looking at the ESV, uh, have a new sentence, matter of fact, a new paragraph, matter of fact, a whole new section marker, wives and husbands, and then wives with a capital W, comma, imperative, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It's a complete sentence that's standing off by itself. Uh, I, I, I'm really um, convinced that in an English translation, the term submit in verse 22 ought to be italicized, especially in a translation like the English Standard Version, which prides itself in being literal. Now, if it's the NIV 2011 or the NIV, 
They, they, they're not advertising a wooden literal translation. They're saying we're trying to put it into contemporary English. The ESV advertises rather strongly. Our version doesn't try to improve on the original. That's one of their key little tags for advertising. We don't try to improve on the original. We just give you the original. Just like that, in English words. We're the best literal translation out. Of course, other people claim to be the best literal translation out too. The New American Standard, uh, for example. <clears throat> but in such a translation, submit should be italicized. Yes, it is implied. No, it's not in the text. Now, if it's clearly implied, why does it matter if it's not in the text? Because the implied verb comes from a statement of mutuality. That's where Paul is coming from. Submit to one another, subcategory, wives to your own husbands. Uh, e even in uh, the conservative complementarian writings like Russell Moore, who's, who's very much to the right of the complementarian camp. He, he wrote an article, I think just last issue of the Journal on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, in which he, he titled the article, Wives, uh, Women Stop Submitting to Men. Catchy title for, for the journal, Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, isn't it? You know, you just want to go read that article really quick because you can't believe they're going to put that as a lead article in their journal, Women Stop Submitting to Men. But his point is what? That Paul doesn't call women to submit to men. He calls the wife to submit to her own husband. So, so in the complementarian movement, it's even in the most conservative edges of it, it's very clear that they're not calling all women to submit to all men in all places. In traditional patriarchy, that was the case. Complementarianism is different from traditional patriarchy. Uh, in strict uh, Muslim societies today, just for one example, uh, there is a sort of corporate sense of authority of men over women. And he, even other men, non, not the husband, but even other men have a, a, uh, the privilege, if not the responsibility, to discipline women who are not acting in a submissive way. Complementarians say, no, none of that. Wives are strictly called to submit to their own husbands. So if we're going to emphasize that detail, I would also emphasize it is part of submitting to one another. Now, how does that fit with an egalitarian read of the passage? Uh, it's important in this context to make clear, because I often hear charges to the contrary, but it's important to make clear that egalitarians are not saying that women, or wives in particular, should not submit to their husbands. That's not the issue. They're just not satisfied with the one statement and not including the rest of the sentence. Or at least, if you divide it differently in your interpretation, your translation, the previous sentence. Submit to one another. Uh, I, I can't remember the title to the book now. It was uh, uh, a biblical manhood and womanhood book, but it was, it was a smaller volume that was done in the, uh, right around, I think, 2000. I'll get it for you. But Bruce Ware, uh, a, uh, an important voice in the complementarian movement, uh, I'd say almost as important as a voice like Wayne Grudem. Bruce Ware writes an article in, in which he titles The Myth of Mutual Submission. The Myth of Mutual Submission. It, it's not a myth. Uh, I think no matter how you flesh it out, it's an explicit statement of Scripture. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, part of that is submitting to one another. If that's not mutual, I don't know what mutual means. And wives to your own husband is part of that. So the question that, that divides complementarians and egalitarians is not a question of should wives submit to husbands. It is a different question. Does that submission somehow imply the husband's leadership? Those seven assumptions uh, of male leadership that we had talked about earlier, does it somehow imply that? And I would say, so far, reading it in order here, so far, the intent of the text is clearly mutual. Mutual submission. Wives, to your own husbands. Perhaps, perhaps Paul is saying that in an effort to actually limit that kind of universal, uni 
uh, universal submission that women might be expected to have toward men in general. Uh, and he's saying, no, wives to your own husbands. And as to the Lord, you know, what, what, what is this saying? We'll, we'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, but just to see the two commands, uh, and when we talked about 12 statements with regard to uh, status and function, we talked about 12 statements regarding mutuality in 1 Corinthians 7, the other in Galatians. So here, two statements. Now, it doesn't make this less important than other passages. It's just simply the fact that Paul makes two prescriptive statements. Sarah Sumner is in a, in a presentation at ETS. She's a theology prophet at Azusa. Uh, she made the comment very poignantly. She said, the text says, wives submit to your husbands. And then in verse 25, husbands love your wives. That's it. Those are the only two prescriptions. So, so I think it's important for us to see that. And then we're gonna, we'll continue talking about the head metaphor and headship. But there's only two commands, two imperatives. Submit and love. Submit and love. And the submit given in the context of mutual submission. Love, nobody, nobody questions. Complementary and egalitarian on whatever part of the spectrum they're on. Nobody questions that love and marriage ought to be mutual. It's obvious. Matter of fact, other places in scripture, wives are told to love their husbands. So, so we don't have to guess about it. Husbands are to love, wives are to submit. That's that. So we know one of the two things Paul is saying is mutual, the love part. We know that the other part, submission, is put in the context of submitting to one another. I would say, with, with a little bit of tongue in cheek, maybe, <clears throat> I would say if we didn't know better, we would understand this passage as promoting mutuality in submitting to one another and loving one another. And that that's the intent of Paul. So, okay, let's come to the text more specifically now uh, in verses 21 through 24. This is what Paul says to the wife. Uh, and I'm not suggesting, I, there, there's a need to be clear here, I think. I'm not suggesting that because it has a cultural background, we somehow set this aside and don't pay attention to it. Uh, I, I'm suggesting the opposite, in fact. I think this is exactly what God wants for us. I am, however, pointing out that it is in a specific cultural context, the Greco-Roman household codes. And that will be made clear as Paul moves from wives and husbands to children and slaves and slave owners, uh, the other issues involved in the Greco-Roman household codes. So he's clearly speaking, explicitly speaking within the context of the code. But in that context, he looks over to the women, to the wives, and says, following the mutual submission statement here, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the kephale in Greek, the head. And, and it literally means this, this uppermost part of the body. Uh, what it means metaphorically is what we have to talk about. But, but it's a head-body metaphor. So, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, if you just put a period there and kind of ignore the rest of the statement, if you just put a period there, you, you are left without definition. What does he mean, as Christ is the head of the church? Uh, I mean, let's think about it just for a second. Is there any difference between Christ and a husband? Quite a few, actually, you know. Christ is perfect. Christ is God. We are not, you know, either one. Uh, and it's, it's rather blatantly obvious that we are not. Uh, are there similarities between Christ and the church and the husband and the wife? Yeah, I could think how the metaphor could be used to draw similarities. Okay, what similarities is, is Paul intending to promote or to suggest or, or to prescribe in this text. That's the, the key text, not what we might think of from other books or, or a broader theology or our own thoughts, but what this text actually explicitly promotes. So look at the, look at the uh, information that Paul gives us. Christ is head of the church, his body, so we know it's a head-body metaphor, keep the medical information in the back of your mind, and is himself its savior. 
he could have said, and is himself its Lord. Which would also have been true, but it would have implied then the husband should somehow be the master or the Lord of the family, which would have been commonly accepted in the Greco-Roman household codes. But Paul is speaking counter-culturally. So as we look at these codes, I'm not suggesting that Paul is endorsing those codes. No, in fact, he is contradicting those codes. He's speaking in a totally different direction. The husband should be the savior. The, the, the one, what does that mean? Well, obviously he can't save his wife in, in, in the most extreme sense. Talked about that in 1 Corinthians, uh, where either the husband or the wife could bring salvation to the other spouse in the sense of spiritual influence. But the husband is the savior, and as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit, hupotasso again, to their own husbands and everything. So, so there's no question that, that submit is implied in this phrase, or in this clause here, uh, because he repeats it, and in this case it does have a verb. So there's no question about submission. But submit to the, their husbands in everything. Let's pause for that for a minute. What does he mean when he says everything? Uh, did, I, did I ask you to read Steve Tracy's article? I think that was in the syllabus, yes. Steve Tracy, as a complementarian, and as a very committed complementarian, it's not something he's in transition on or something, uh, I think has, has written an excellent uh, article in uh, so, sort of describing and, and sort of encountering, uh, looking very closely at the issue of submitting in everything. Uh, let me just start with, it, with a most simple observation that we have talked about already, and that is uh, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. And the wife does not have authority, but yields it to her husband. So, so we, we agreed for the most part, and not everybody said something last time, but we agreed for the most part that at least in the area of sexual intimacy, this sort of unilateral submission to whatever the husband says, to his authority, is, is not unilateral, but it actually is mutual. We submit to one another. So in everything, see, seems to be qualified by the First Corinthians statement, which Paul's already made. So, so this is a follow-up on that. We read this passage in light of the earlier writings of Paul. That, that's just normal hermeneutics. <clears throat> we already agreed and this is something that comes more from a logical deduction, I think, but uh, egalitarians, complementarians readily agree that a wife should not do something under the authority of her husband that would take her against the very explicitly stated will of God. So if her husband says, go murder somebody, go worship pagan gods in the ancient Roman context, no, she's not obligated to submit to him in everything, meaning that. So, so, so there, are, there is at least some legitimate and agreed upon discussion of what submitting and everything means. I, I, I think it is, is further explained by as to the Lord. So, so this is in the context of submission in Christ, a Christian context. <clears throat> it will be further explained in Colossians, and I don't want to jump ahead to the passage at this point. But my understanding, and I think Tracy would say the same thing, it means a wholehearted submission. This isn't like, okay, I, I know I have to submit, uh, yield my body in the sense of sexual intimacy. Uh, but eh, other areas, no thank you. Or vice versa, you can, you can exclude sexual intimacy uh, if you wish, perhaps based on 1 Corinthians 7, 4. But it's saying, it's not, it's not specifying quantity of things that you're supposed to be submitting in, but or air, areas, <coughs> excuse me, but it is specifying, I think, the, the wholehearted submission, like you would submit to Christ. This should be a voluntary, wholehearted yielding to your spouse. This is all wives are told. <clears throat> The husband, one last thing on this, the husband is the head of the wife. Now, now in Greek, as it is in English, properly translated in ESV, uh, <clears throat> it is not a command. It's not an imperative. It's a, it's a statement of fact. The husband is the head of the wife, like Christ is head of the church. Uh, it doesn't call the husband to be the head of the wife. It recognizes the husband's headship. 
Now, now for further definition of that, that headship, we should look to what Paul calls the husband to do as head of the wife. So it's easy to say, I'm head of my household, but what does that mean, that I'm head of my household? How does that flesh out in our relationship with our spouses, with one another? So, let's look at the other half of the passage. It's a longer statement to the husbands, <coughs> and it will eventually merge rather uh, subtly into a statement about the church. He'll go back to the church, but uh, for husbands, again, one statement, love your wives. Radically countercultural to the Greco-Roman household code. There was no requirement for husbands to love their wives. Uh, they should provide for their wives, of course, you know, and the, uh, but they could find love elsewhere. So love your wives as Christ loved the church, and, and there underscore, kind of double underscore, with that radical kind of self-giving love. Now, how did Christ love the church? Think in terms of, of Philippians 2 here, where he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, held on to, his power, his authority, his position, but rather he became a servant even unto death, death of the cross. Now, I think this is exactly what Paul is talking about here. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Here's where Michelle Lee Barnwell's article, I think, becomes very important, and, and I'm just longing and yearning for it to actually come into print. Uh, she read it at ETS a very long time ago. Thankfully, we have the MP3 to listen to, but it, it is in the process of being published and has been for about five years now. So it's, it's very disappointing that, that she hasn't got that out in print yet. She may get her own book out in print before that article comes out in print. So she's working on that. <clears throat> but the head, the husband, and by the way, headship language now is, is there, there's nothing for the husband to do as head. He doesn't address the husband as head and say, as head, you should do something. Okay, so he kind of leaves that with regard to the wife. But husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up, self up for her. Uh, <clears throat> think of the medical terminology again, the metaphor of head body. <clears throat> if you want to give life, uh, a sanctifying life to your wife, then cut off the head for the sake of the body. Uh, Michelle calls this the radical reversal, the, the rhetoric of reversal uh, in Paul's language. Uh, Wayne Grudem has done the most extensive uh, extra-biblical sort of word study on Kephale, and in that he shows many examples I don't think it always means this, I disagree with him on that, but many examples of where head has this connotation of leadership or authority. And so Paul uses the terminology, speaking to the wife, not to the husband, uses terminology, and then he says to the husband, give yourself up for your wife. Uh, it, it, it's <clears throat> that New Testament paradox of finding life by doing what? Dying, giving it up, dying to yourself. If you want to become rich, then give it all away. Become poor for the sake of the gospel. That radical inversion of what we would normally think is logical. So what should the husband do? And I'll give you in the context of a statement regarding him being the head of the wife, what should he do? He should sacrifice himself for the wife. Love sacrificially. There's no statement about spiritual direction, making final decisions, being more responsible, taking the lead, all of these things. Give yourself up for her, that he might sanctify, using Christ now as the example, sanctify her by having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blame, blameless, we saw in 1 Corinthians 7, and this is why that passage shouldn't be ignored in reading Ephesians, we saw in 1 Corinthians 7 that the wife can have a sanctifying influence on the husband. And the husband, likewise, can have a sanctifying influence on the wife. It goes both ways. Here, Paul is talking about one way. 
He's not saying it doesn't go the other way. He is just specifically talking to husbands and saying, hey, you can have a sanctifying influence on your wife. You can sacrifice for her and love her in a way that helps her to grow in Christ. Egalitarians have no problem at all with the explicit statement of scripture here. As a matter of fact, I embrace this as a wonderful thing that I can do for my wife. But I also recognize by looking at the larger picture of scripture, 1 Corinthians 7, that she can, and in fact often does, do the very same thing for me. That she loves me in a sacrificial way that helps me to grow in Christ. And as, as she yields herself to me, I can serve her, which, which I think in this text is another way of saying mutual submission. I mean, what, what's the difference when you think about it between yielding yourself to someone and serving someone for, for their benefit? Yielding yourself to someone for the greater good. I, I think he's using synonyms, uh, not, not terms that, that set sort of distinct gender roles in the context, but two different ways of, of being the loving, submitting, servant kind of person that we are called to follow in the way of Christ. So in the same way, in the same way as Christ here, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. So a radical sense of love that was not common in the culture to which Paul wrote. It's not very common to the culture in which he might write to us today. The one who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Here that concept of source of provision comes across rather clearly. Just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Going back to the theme of oneness that he started with. So for this reason, just to close out this verse, and then I want to make a reference to Colossians. For this reason, <clears throat> for what reason? For the, for the sake of mutual submission, service, love, respect. A man will leave his father and mother, and he, he cites, of course, Genesis 2. A man will leave his father and mother, something that we generally don't think of today. It got reversed rather early in human history. Uh, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. He, he started this whole discussion talking about the body of Christ being one radical new humanity. And now that is mirrored in the marriage relationship, which is one in Christ, one flesh as God intended in creation. Now it is in the new creation. I'm talking about Christ in the church, he says, in case you thought I was talking about marriage here. <laughs> I think, wait a minute, you were talking about marriage. Uh, he, he, he kind of goes back and forth between the two. And then he comes back. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And once again, that is not the, that is not the question. That is not the debate uh, in the contemporary gender debate between complementarians and egalitarians. No one's debating whether she should submit or he should love. The question is, does her submission imply his authority, and should he somehow exercise authority in a variety of different ways? That Paul doesn't address in this passage. He doesn't touch on those seven assumptions of male leadership that we often bring to the passage. The only thing that you can build that from, and I would, I would disagree with Soci on building it off the word submission, especially since it's mutual, but the only thing you might build it from is the meaning of head, but how is head used in the passage? <clears throat> Every time, it refers to Christ and the church. It's a source of provision, not an exercising of authority, without exception, in the book of Ephesians and in the book of Colossians, the twin books. Okay, <clears throat> just to complete the household code references here, children then, fathers with children, slaves, earthly masters, oops, sorry, uh, the typical categories of the household codes. So when Paul says, slaves, obey your earthly masters, is he implying that masters ought to have authority over the slaves? Not necessarily. In fact, judging from the letter he wrote this same year to Philemon, not at all. He never endorses Philemon's authority over Onesimus. He calls him to treat him as a brother 
no longer as a slave. He says, don't, don't, don't go to those categories anymore of authority. Let go of your authority and treat him like a brother. Treat him like you would me, uh, an apostle. So treat your slaves in the same way. Okay, one more shot from 1969 and, and a couple clo uh, short references to Colossians. But uh, yeah, yeah, the rings, $35. They were, they were, and it wasn't because they were cheap, it was just 44 years ago. Uh, <coughs> so we still have those rings, although we have kind of renewed with new rings here. But loving and serving each other, Colossians, same context, same year, same issues for backdrop. Uh, and let's just turn to it uh, with me, if you would, because I want you to see the actual text itself so you know I'm not making this stuff up. But we can actually hear it in the very words of Paul. So uh, Colossians 1 and verse 2. We'll just pick up with the key passages. To the saints and faithful brothers and sisters, brethren, I think ESV wrongly translate brothers here, uh, because when Paul writes to a church, he's not excluding women in his letters. Uh, so, to the saints and the faithful brethren, if you please, in Christ, at Colossae, same in Christ, emphasis, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Uh, verse 3, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of love that you have for all the saints <clears throat> because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of of the truth of the gospel. So he's using the very same sort of catchphrases that he used in Galatians. I don't think Galatians is an irrelevant passage for 1 Corinthians 7 and for Ephesians 4 and Colossians. So skip down to verse 9. And so from the day we heard this, we've not ceased praying for you, asking that you may be filled. There's this filled with the spirit language from Ephesians. Five, and in this case, filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Same, same idea. <clears throat> so as to walk. There's that status in Christ leading to obedience in Christ, a consistent theme of Paul's. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Skip down to verse 15. Skip over to that. <clears throat> Christ, he, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. <clears throat> For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, authorities, rulers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And here we have it again. He is the head of the body, the church. What does that mean, Paul? What are you, what are you saying when you use this metaphor? He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So, so the headship of Christ is not about authority over the church again. Even though that is also true, it is not what Paul is talking about in this particular passage. So another reference to Christ as head of the church in the twin letters that helps us to see this is about uh, a sense of, uh, uh, of being the firstborn of the creatures that will follow, uh, the new creatures, new creation people that will follow. Uh, he is our, our source or the one who goes before us. Beginning, remember back in Genesis we talked about Rosh, the Hebrew equivalent for kephale, being used as the in the beginning language of verse 1 of chapter 1, uh, at the head of all things God created, and then the head of the rivers. So the beginning or the source or the point of origin is a common use by Paul of the idea of head. Skip to uh, verse 6 of chapter 2. Let me come over to chapter 2 here. <coughs> I'll pick up there and we'll come to the passage we're making reference to here. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Uh, this, this would be number 13 of the statements if it were included in the book of Galatians by Paul to talk about status and function. And in the way you receive Christ, so you walk in Christ. Rooted, 
and build up in him. Do you feel that sense of, of source, of point of origin, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, one of the examples of the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 9, for in Christ, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. Source of provision again. Who is the head of all rule and authority? Just like in Ephesians 1, so here in Colossians 2, head carries the connotation of rule over the world for the sake of, the benefit of the church, to be that source of provision. Verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. There's authority. There's headship as authority, the domination of Christ over the worldly authorities for the benefit of his body, the church, which he lovingly gave himself up for. Verse 16, therefore let no one pass judgment on you. And notice the familiar topics in questions of food and drink and with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, 1 Corinthians 7, where, where they thought, hey, the end times are here, we need to abstain from sexual relations or maybe abstain from marriage altogether, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. This is Christ again, from whom the whole body, head body metaphor, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. So, so what does head mean for Paul in these two letters? Consistently now, four times over, <coughs> it carries the idea of a source of nourishment or a source of provision for the sake of the church. Uh, and the issue that we saw in Galatians as the primary issue is raised in Ephesians, Jew Gentile is raised in Colossians. This is building off the Jew Gentile paradigm and coming to address men and women in the context. Chapter three, <coughs> let me bring up the other slide then. Uh, raised with Christ, seeking the things above. Here's that status function. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek, imperative, the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Skip to verse 11. Here there is not Jew, uh, Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. He doesn't cover every category and he doesn't speak of the same thing he talked about with regarding gender, but he covers the other categories and he says, no, None of that stuff. But Christ is all and in all. Just as we're in Christ, Christ is in us. <coughs> and here is the, the, the paragraph that follows, I think, is where we often um, skip the text to get to the more pointed statement about marriage, a husband and wife. But it is the, the context, the immediate context from which verse 18 comes. So, so let's just hear it. Uh, I think I mentioned to you before when, when I had the privilege of performing our, our son's wedding. This, this was my text for the pastoral charge, uh, verses 12 through 17. And I, I won't preach the sermon. I'll just read the text and hear the language of it. Put on then as God's chosen ones. That's Jewish language from Exodus. But now it, it applies to us as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. Here you have that phrase again. And if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. One of the most important words to learn to say in a marriage relationship is, I'm sorry, forgiving one another. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in 
one body in Christ. I think the most important identity for husband and wife is to be in Christ. Uh, and if I only have the 10 or 12 minutes that I had that day, what would I talk about? It's this kind of thing. This is what shapes, I think, a godly marriage. It shapes godly relationships between singles. Uh, it is the Christian way to live. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, it sounds familiar, from Ephesians, with thankfulness in your hearts, and whatever you do, in word or in deed. Not just what you profess about Christ, but how you live it out, in word and deed. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, plenty of things for us to do, as Ed Curtis likes to say. We just do what the text says, we have more on our plates than we can say grace over. We have plenty of things to do as a married couple, I think, in Christ. Word and deed, live it out. And then the phrase comes, and it's only a short one, wives, submit to your husbands, and here I think it's the clarifying statement, as is fitting in the Lord. I, I think that, that is the intentional parallel to as unto the Lord that we see in Ephesians. And you take the two together, and we understand more richly what that means. In other words, you don't submit to him if he tells you to do something unchristian. You don't, don't have to yield to his demands or authority to you in that sense, but you yield to one another as is fitting in the Lord, to yield to one another. The one another statements that are so clear. And husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. And that's it. That's all it says about marriage. And it's the same two things that we heard in Ephesians. Submit and love. Yield and love. Children obey your parents in everything. It pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And then just the first verse of chapter 4. Masters... I should have brought that down, sorry. There we go. Masters, treat your bondservants or your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Paul's statements are not implying an endorsement of slave masters. They are implying the submission of the slave. They are explicitly stating, I should say, the submission of the slave. The masters, in turn, are not called to exercise authority over their slaves. They are called to treat them justly and fairly, or as he said to Philemon, as a brother in Christ and no longer as a slave. So I'll leave this chart up after the uh, break in a, in a minute as a comparison, but <clears throat> Ephesians 5, submit for wives, husbands to love, There's your, there are your two imperatives. Uh, he does acknowledge the husband is the head uh, of the wife. And what does he mean by that? Now we have six statements that help us to understand headship, or the idea of the head-body metaphor. Again, would be better than adding the abstract idea of headship. But the head-body metaphor, and in every one of six statements in these passages, he emphasizes Christ as the source of provision for the church. Loving, serving, sacrificing. There's not a hint in the passage of any kind of male leadership, or men should in some way do the seven assumptions that we often bring to the passages. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.